Good morning. Um, I think in ways that Professor Skior could not have possibly imagined, this conference has got a particular resonance for me. Um, Professor Skior has already mentioned my book and I'm sure that's why she invited me. Um, and, and just to hear about, to talk a bit about the work that I do with doctors and dentists. But what I suspect she didn't know was that the whole topic of healthcare provider mental health is one that has huge relevance to me. I mention it very briefly, there's a very light disclosure in it, but actually not only is it a topic of relevance, but it's actually a topic related to UCL. Because over 30 years ago, I was a PhD student at UCL in the Department of Psychology working with Professor Fonicky. And in the course of 10 days, I experienced two traumatic bereavements. And to use a very technical term, I completely lost the plot. I don't think it's a term you're gonna find in DSM. And I was so traumatized that everything about my PhD became aversive and I, I, I fled. And eventually I got my act together and I moved my PhD to the medical school. Um, and it took me a long time because I had two other, I had a child already when I started, I had two further children. I was working part-time doing my PhD. Now I want to stress that the move had everything to do with me and absolutely nothing to do with a lack of support from the Department of Psychology. But it really means a huge amount to me this morning, um, 33 years later to be speaking at this conference, because I know, I know from diaries that I took at the time that I thought my working life was over, my family life was over, everything was over. I could not have possibly imagined that 33 years later, I would be invited to speak at a conference uh, uh, in the psychology department at UCL. And I hope that for people who may be listening today, who may be going through a similarly awful time in their lives, and there are enough reasons as, as Professor Fonagy has indicated already linked if one's been working in COVID, um, I hope that they may, you may draw some comfort from the idea that you can go through wretched periods of your life and then, and then things, can, things can get better. And perhaps too, if there are people who in future have very difficult periods of their life and they think that because of what they've gone through as psychologists, as psychiatrists, as GPs or whatever, as nurses, that it's going to mean that their working lives are over. Perhaps they can just remember uh, the Tuesday morning in July where there was that lady who, who began the conference by saying that actually you can go through appalling periods and then you can you know you can resume your careers so definitely enough about me um i'm going to this is not a million miles from the psychology department this is stuart's house in russell square and i was employed there um for six years between 2008 and 2014. And I worked for something called, it's not called that anymore because in the health service, everything changes, but it was at that point called London Deanery, um, it, which is formerly the, the de Department of Postgraduate Medical and Dental Education. And deaneries for those who aren't involved in medical education or dental education, are the bits of the health service that look after the postgraduate training um, of doctors and dentists from the time they leave that undergraduate training to the time they're a fully qualified GP, consultant, dentist, whatever. And my job was to set up something called the careers unit, which still exists. Um, and I was there to provide career support um, to, to any doctor or any dentist in the sort of 80 plus hospitals uh, in London, who for some reason or other um, were having doubts about their, uh, about their career. I worked there for six years and I counseled many hundreds of doctors. I also ran workshops for senior clinicians on how to support their trainees, all that sort of stuff. But in 2004, I left because I, I for many reasons why I left, but I main reason was that I wanted to write about what I had um, uh, experienced having counseled hundreds of doctors and I wanted to write what I wanted to write and I knew that there was a clause in my contract that meant that if I was a health education England employee the dean would have had to see what I wrote 
Um, I also wanted the time to write. So uh, I left, but I left in good standing and I continue despite the criticisms that I have, which are not criticisms about London in particular, they're criticisms of the system, the national system. So that's actually the American cover. It looks a bit different from the cover that Professor Skill um, uh, held up. So I wondered how to talk about doctors that, you know, I had seen hundreds in 30 minutes or so. And I took the decision, I'm going to take, tell the story of just one doctor. It's not actually a doctor who featured in the book. It's a doctor I thought about writing about, but it's a doctor who was perhaps rather unique and her story illustrates many of the recurring themes that I write about in the book. Um, she's also a doctor with whom I'm still in contact and she gave me permission uh, to tell her story. Her name has been changed and identifying details have been changed to protect her identity. But in all other respects, this is Mather's story. So, Mother was born in the north of England. Her parents had both been born in India, uh, attended university in India and came to the UK to seek a better life. Neither of them were able to get a graduate level job. Her father worked on an assembly line. Her mother was a housework who did a bit of part-time secretarial work. Now, unsurprisingly, given that background, Mada's family valued the importance of getting a good education and gaining professional qualifications because her parents didn't have professional qualifications. They weren't able to get graduate and entry, graduate level jobs in the UK. Mada was the eldest of five. Her other four siblings all entered different professions. She was the only doctor. She was bright, very hardworking, and she obtained a place to study medicine in her hometown. Um, and she went in as, as an undergraduate straight from secondary school. About 90% of uh, medical students in the UK do this. She lived at home during her studies, which again is more common uh, for doctors who are um, from BME backgrounds. And significantly, her father was made redundant very early on in her studies. So she kept a part-time job going right the way throughout the five years so she could help with fine, fine, um, family finances. And she did, she had this part-time job in a department store right until the last year of medical school. And as she was very you know, bright and organized, she actually got promoted in her part-time job that she did as well. Mada found the first year at medical school really, really hard. The majority of students in medicine come from much wealthier backgrounds, not from working class backgrounds. And many had been to private secondary schools. She told me that she felt ashamed she didn't have their sporting or musical accomplishments. She hadn't done fencing. She didn't play the harp. She hadn't gone a, on a gap year to work on ecological problems in Costa Rica. That was not her experience. And also it's the first time that she was getting average results rather than being top of the class. In the comprehensive where she'd gone through, she'd been always been top of the class. And now she was in the middle. But she was bright, focused, hardworking. And in the end, she got through the five years without any difficulty. She didn't do uh, uh, some medical schools. It's compulsory, some it's optional. Where she was, it was optional. You can add on an intercalated degree. But she didn't do that because she wanted to be working as soon as possible to help contribute to uh, family, to contribute to the family finances. So on graduating from medical school, uh, Mada went into the foundation program and this is a two-year program that all medical graduates in the UK have to go through. Like many foundation doctors she found the workload pressures, the understaffing, the huge responsibilities really really tough. Now in theory they're lovely organisational charts in about all the sort of different levels of um, uh, command and that in theory as a foundation year one doctor you won't be alone making you know critically important clinical decisions that's the theory in practice it can be really very different and I write about somebody's first first day at work right at the beginning of my book actually a doctor who um, was completely flawed didn't know what to do and another foundation colleague walked past saw that her colleague was about to burst into tears and said I'll call my mum 
She said, what do you mean you'll call my mum? Well, my mum's an A&E nurse. She'll know what to do. And they called her mum. Do you really want a health service that depends upon somebody calling their mum? Probably not. Um, so it was really tough. Also, and this is much more common about from doctors from working class backgrounds, doctors from um, BME backgrounds, she was living away from home for the first time. Um, and although this didn't apply to Mother because she did quite well in the allocation of, of jobs um, into the foundation pro uh, program, there's an absolutely brilliant way in which the system works to show that uh, to send the most vulnerable doctors to those uh, foundation jobs that people don't want uh, in parts of the country that people don't want to go to and which are likely to be furthest away from home where they have their support. Um, and that's a pattern that gets repeated again and again. But with Mother's customary hard work and determination, she got through the two years programme and she successfully applied to the next stage of training. Most doctors do get through, some, some don't. And I actually, I got interested in, in, in some of the questions about earlier history from, from, from the doctors who didn't get through the foundation programme, finding out that they'd had very, very, bumpy rides in um, med school, but this that wasn't Mada's problem. So she got through the foundation program and moved on to the next stage, in her case, core medical training. And this is when the problems ratcheted up. Her aunt, to whom she was very close, became ill with cancer and then died. Her family looked to her during this period as she was the doctor in the family. And again, this is common. Managing, so she was managing of family demands, family distress on top of a full time clinical job. And she didn't have a lot of time to revise her specialty exams. So she failed them in the first couple of attempts, not uncommon. But this un undermined her confidence. Her relationship with her then broke, boyfriend broke down. She was devastated because she had thought this relationship was, he was the one and that she was going to get married. And as she hadn't completed her exam, she wasn't eligible for, to apply for training in her preferred specialty, rheumatology. Um, so the following year she did get her exam, she took a one year post, but she, she sort of lost heart and just couldn't face the length of training to qualify to rheumatology. She applied for GP as it's a much shorter training program than qualifying as a rheumatologist. So in the UK, GP trainees typically spend, it can differ in different schemes, but it's currently three year training. Um, whereas specialty hospital specialties are six years plus. Um, and of those three years, often they spend 18, it can, it can be done slightly differently, but it's typically 18 months in hospital and 18 months in GP practices. Now her first job was in Obs and Gynae. She felt unprepared, she was poorly supported. She'd never done Obs and Gynae before. She was also surrounded by pregnant women. When prior to splitting up with her boyfriend, she had hoped that she might be starting a family at this point. And following then the six months in OBS and Gynae, which she found really stressful, she did six months in emergency medicine where she was really well supported in, in A&E and which she really enjoyed. And in fact, the consultants there wanted her to switch from GP to emergency medicine because they were so impressed by her work. But she decided to continue in GP because that would allow her to qualify more quickly. Her next rotation was in palliative care. Now this is an emotionally demanding specialty for all doctors, but if one's recently had a significant bereavement, as Mada had, the death of her aunt, the death of terminally ill patients uh, the one is caring for can be a constant reminder of the death of a loved one. Mada told me, and I thought this indicated really good insight on her part, that she just wasn't mo emotionally ready for working in the hospice at that point. But crucially, her senior consultants who were supervising her, they didn't see a distressed doctor. They saw a failing doctor. 18 months into the programme, she started in a GP practice. She found that she really missed the buzz of hospitals and found it very isolating just to be sitting on her own in, a cons in, in the GP's consultation room very different from hospital practice. Her supervisor didn't know how keen and enthused she'd been in the past and just saw her as a demotivated, failing trainee. 
The workload is enormous. MADA was working towards being able to see patients. This is the standard that you have to be signed off of in 10 minutes. Now, just think about that. My mother died in 2017, age 94. And if I think when I took her to the GP, the GP would call her name. She would walk slowly to the GP's surgery. She would sit down, draw breath. She would then explain the problem slowly. She men then may need to be examined. She would walk slowly to, to, you know, to, the, to the couch. She would undress slowly and painfully, even with health. She'd get up on the couch. Then she had to get back down after the examination, put her clothes on, return to the patient's seat. How can you do that in 10 minutes? Again and again and again and again. It's often it's possible for some patients, but also the way that the primary care has gone with all these other uh, um, nurses, paramedics, all sorts of other people, healthcare assistants in the practice, the sort of sprained ankle thing that might, that GPs used to have, that would be a quick consultation, which would enable you to catch up on time. Those ones are all farmed out to other people. So they have a much more uh, concentrated data complexity. So I see a huge number of GPs. It's hugely, hugely demanding. Um, on top of the clinical load, trainees um, in, all, in all specialties have a, a, a demanding schedule. They've got to do lots of workplace assessments. They've got to be observed doing things and be signed off for it. They've got to do audits of clinical work. Um, they've got to do all sorts of reflective pieces, as I'm sure you do in, in, have to do in psychology, and yet more exams. And often in the doctors and I see it's these other things, they just about keep the clinical work going, but it's all the other gump that they've got to do, which is not related to the well-being of a patient. It's definitely related to the well-being of their career progression. It's that stuff that slips. She fell behind in keeping her portfolio of assessments. Um, she didn't fix up the out of hours sessions. She had to do, you have to do a certain number of uh, working in GP urgent care sessions. She, she couldn't face sitting the GP ex specialty exam. She knew she hadn't done enough provision. And significantly, all of this was radically different to how she'd been at earlier stages of her career. When she had her annual appraisal, she was told that she'd have to have an extra six months to catch up. And she felt she was failing, falling ever more behind and she was very, very distressed. And this is the point we got to at the end of our first session. And actually, by the end of the first session, I felt exhausted because this whole story had been conveyed with such enormous urgency and rush. I felt a bit like a cartoon psychologist who'd been gone splat and flattened against the wall. I remember the title of this talk is Handle with Care. As Mada was leaving at the door, she turned to me and she said, the reason I did medicine was probably because my sister died a cot death when I was six. I was with my mother when she went into his, when she went into her bedroom and I found her dead. That's when I decided to become a doctor. Now we'd been reviewing her career over the past 90 minutes, but it was only as she was leaving that she was able to tell me this. And many healthcare practitioners who are listening this morning are probably familiar with door handle comments. When patients tell them probably the most salient thing, the thing that is really on their mind at the point when they're leaving. And sometimes in my work, I get it from the doctors and dentists who come to see me. And I think that this was probably the most important thing Mada said to me in the whole session. And I then began to understand her sister's death, uh, uh, how it had impacted not only on her decision to be a doctor, but it also contributed to this enormous sense of urgency and rush. Because I think in effect, Mada wanted to be a doctor in the shortest possible time. So it was only once she was fully qualified that she might feel equipped to deal with medical emergencies that she knew from first-hand experience could have devastating results. So she was, there was this huge internal pressure within her. So, what are some of the themes I want to pick out? What the, what's some general themes that Mada's story illustrates? Firstly, each doctor 
every doctor has a personal and family illness history. Every, every doctor and indeed every healthcare provider brings their own experience of illness, their personal and their family experience of illness to their choice of profession. There's a Canadian study which compared legal students with medical students. And if you, um, if you excluded those whose parents were doctors or lawyers, so they were the first in a family to take those profession, those who came had chosen law had had more legal dealings in their family history, in the sort of family narrative. And those who had chosen medicine, there was more uh, sort of illness stuff going on in those families. And that, that's not necessarily a bad thing. So with Mada, it was the tragedy of witnessing her baby sister's death. With others, it can be the death of a parent or their own illness. And this isn't necessarily problematic, but it can be. And I write about this in the book. And actually, it's a UCL student in the book that I write about. Obviously, I don't say that, but uh, there have been many, many thousands of UCL medical students. So I don't think it, it, it I don't think it says anything about it doesn't breach her confidentiality. And, and this student walked onto the oncology ward, the one I write about in the book. And her dad had died of cancer when she was about seven. And she walked onto the oncology ward at, in, in, in UCH. And there was a middle-aged guy, bald from chemo, about the same age as her dad, from the same ethnic group, and she fainted. Now, what I would like is that we are training healthcare pr practitioners to be cure to be aware of their own illness histories and family illness histories and to be curious about them she wasn't a fainter she hadn't fainted at any other time she came to see me seven years later than that when she was in in her starting training as an oncologist and she had a, a bit like me from the from the from my, the psychology department but she she fled she 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 crashed her car twice within the spirit period of a few weeks because she was so desperate to get out of the ward the oncology ward this was six years later and it was only when we're talking about it and trying to see if there was any intimation that oncology might be too much she remembered this fainting episode what i would like is that that we're training healthcare providers to be aware and curious so that there was somebody she could go and talk to about that and have a think about about it and just plant the seed that maybe for her oncology was going to be too much because when I saw her seven years later and she'd fled from her oncology training program she described it to me as constantly scratching open the wound and she changed specialty and she's now and I followed her up for my book and she's a very content happy GP so there's something about being aware uh, and, and teaching healthcare practitioners to be aware of their own illness histories and their family illness histories. But of course, it's not only the impact of one's personal and family medical his history, it's, I, it's not only in the past, it's also things happen currently and, and will happen in future. Because as a doctor goes through or a psychologist goes through their career, things can happen to them and those they love that will have an impact on their work. For example, in Madda's case, she might have experienced Dobbs and Gynae a bit differently if she hadn't recently split up from her partner. And she might not have found her palliative care job so distressing if her aunt hadn't recently died. The culture, certainly in medicine, I know less about psychology training, can be that the doctors shouldn't be affected by these things, that they should be, they should rise above them. And that that's, you know, one of the reasons why I call my book also human, not only human, because we use only human when we're trying, when we make a mistake and we're trying to sort of justify it. I, I wanted, I was clear that I wanted it to be also human because it's shared with the patient. Um, and, and it's absolute nonsense, the idea that anybody, if, if things in their family, personal life are happening related to their work, that it's not going to, there's not going to be some resonance. And we want, rather than the mantra that they should rise above it, we want to be able to think about how we can support somebody in that 
in, in that situation. So to give another example, I once saw a doctor who had um, recently lost, uh, had a stillbirth. Um, so she'd carried to term, and the, and, uh, but, the, but the baby had died during the birthing process. And she was about to, she was a pediatric trainee and she was about to rotate to neonates. And she came to me in bits and sort of said, I can't do it. And I said, you don't have to do this at this point. Let's find a way. And that was one of the joys of working within the system. And luckily I knew the head of pediatrics very well. I don't think you have to rotate to neonates. Let's find a way of changing your rotation. But I've in other specialties and other cultures which are kind of less psychologically minded it, it can be just you shouldn't be feeling this you're a doctor you don't feel you shouldn't have any any this the resonance between your own health and 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 your clinical work they should be a complete there should be a complete barrier and in my book uh, you know i and i i won't go into this now but i i think it's a kind of it's a systemic defense against the distress of the difficult things that doctors are exposed to all the time that the that that splitting is is how professionally it's managed but of course it 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 it, it it's not a healthy way of managing it ultimately it has an impact um so we need to be teaching healthcare providers that it's not surprising when things going on in their personal life have an impact on how they feel about their work and vice versa. And we need to teach them how best to manage this, where they can go to for support, rather than telling them what's going on at home is irrelevant. Demography, this is absolutely huge. Race, class, gender. Medical students from poorer backgrounds are underrepresented in the UK. We need to be aware of how social class can have an effect on confidence, which is a key personal quality that doctors are going to be assessed on. Um, I've had examples of with doctors from very working class backgrounds, extraordinarily bright, who've come through great diversity to get a, a adversity to get a place in med school, have been criticised for their acts, their more working class accent or grammar or whatever that is not sufficiently, rather than rather than actually noting how the patients respond to a doctor who sounds more like them, they're criticised. Um, issues of gender, Again, we have in medicine, it's a feminized profession. I suspect it's the same in, 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 many, in, in many other healthcare professions, including psychology. Medical training is perhaps different from other healthcare professions in just the length of training. It is so long. After a five or five or six years, then you then you're going to have, you can have eight, nine, ten more full-time years in, in some specialties. And you're trying to, and you're going to be rotated through all sorts of different hospitals. Often you don't know within weeks before where you're going to be working. And just try to imagine this when you're trying to manage that with a young family. And then maybe your partner's a medic as well. So gender is really important. There's still sexism in some, particularly the surgical specialties, and race. Um, Many of the doctors I see, we see a disproportionate number of BME doctors um, in the work I do for Health Education England. I'd re I recently asked for the, the stats on that, and we do. Um, and in my book, I talk about somebody I named Professor Only Interested in Marriage. And this was the professor at a London, dean of a London medical school since retired, who when I went to see him for a meeting, just the two of us were in this private meeting about kind of preparing students for starting in foundation. Um, he told me that he said, um, we've got too many Asian girls who are only interested in marriage. Uh, Kath Wolf, who's, a psych, who's at the academic um, medical education department within UCL Med School, has done excellent work on race. And I think, and I argue in the book, I think that racism is particularly pernicious. It's particularly corrosive uh, in, in professions like medicine, like uh, psychology, in anywhere where you're having 
to bear enormous responsibility because what the racism does is that it corrodes, it eats into one's sense that one's good enough to do the job. Um, health systems across the world are under enormous pressure. The volume, complexity of med medical care are constantly increasing alongside pressures to reduce costs, reduce errors, document more. Mother's journey might have, in primary care might have, for example, have been easier if she wasn't expected to see patients in 10 minutes. And these pressures were there before COVID. Mother's case was before COVID. Burnout is a systemic condition. It's not a condition caused by a lack of personal resilience. And we really need, as has been uh, talked about in the introduction to today's conference, but as, as healthcare providers, and particularly I think as psychologists or psychiatrists, those, those, those of us who are being trained to, be, to have the skills of critical appraisal of the, of the literature, of, of, of the research literature, there is absolutely clear evidence about the systemic nature of, of, of occupational burnout. And it's due to lack of control. In, in the amount of work that you do. It's due to being asked to do jobs that you don't feel that you're being trained to or you have the resources to do adequately. And, 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 and it's also due to kind of whether you feel that you belong in the team. And so we need to, um, even more so because with COVID, we need to be really critical about the rhetoric of personal resilience. And because it's very easy, it's cheaper to blame the individual than to really look uh, at, at the systemic uh, failings. Um, both in the UK and the US, a significant minority of doctors regret their specialty choice. Mata left her GP training and eventually managed to get a place to train as a rheumatologist. There's all sorts of ways in which she wasn't particularly well suited to GP. For example, she loved the buzz of hospitals, working as part of a team. We know that working in uh, the work specialty that you don't find satisfying also can contribute to burnout. But uh, until 2008, when the service that I set up was, was set up and there were comparable services around the country, um, no, there are over 60 specialties, but doctors weren't given any help in, in trying to find the right one. There's a, a, a large literature um, on errors in clinical judgment and how a cognitive bias when a doctor is convinced a patient is suffering from a particular condition can mean that they then start to see symptoms in the light of that diagnosis rather than keeping an open mind that they could possibly be really wrong. And in my work, I sometimes see an educational equivalence of this. At a certain point, MADA was seen as a demotivated failing trainee and everything that happened subsequently was interpreted in that light. It was difficult for her supervisors to step back and consider an alternative explanation. And in this sort of situation, I'm often reminded of the classic experiments carried out by Rosenhan on being the paper, on being sane in insane places, where participants feigned psychiatric symptoms. They were all clinical psychology students, the participants, um, and they got themselves admitted to psychiatric hospitals. Of course, they wouldn't be able to get admitted now on the basis of that, because it's so hard to be admitted to a psychiatric hospital. But when they were admitted to this in the study, they acted normally, and it took them weeks for any Anybody to notice that they weren't in fact mentally unwell because they were in the hospital because they're in the hospital they were viewed through a lens that saw them as psychiatrically ill rather than anybody being able to stand back and see them more objectively and central to avoiding this outcome is the critical importance of taking a rich history in your clinical work everybody I suspect in the room knows this you always take a history but educationally, this doesn't always happen. And so I think that my final plea is to encourage those of you who are involved with supervising and supporting healthcare trainees to make sure that somebody somewhere um, has the time and the skills to take a detailed educational and career history. And this is something I feel very passionately about, as you can probably see, and something that I bang out on a, a huge amount when I'm training others. So that's me, and um, I'm happy to answer questions. <laughs>